separately on YouTube too. Okay, I'll just say got it. Okay, yeah, now we're live on YouTube. Good. All right, welcome everybody. We got a very special guest here today. So happy to finally have her on my YouTube. She's been a long time friend, colleague, guest of the show. Going back to like 2015, 2016, I think was the very first time I talked to Maria. And ever since then, we've always stayed in contact and shared information and worked together on various projects even. And it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Ms. Maria Wheatley. Maria, it's so I'm so happy and it's an honor to be able to spend this time here with you today. And it's a pleasure to have you on finally on my YouTube so we got we could see you in person. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. And it's like you you're right. It's a long time ago that we first contacted. How yeah. Lovely. Yeah, it's it's uh it, time goes by so incredible. I can't believe even my daughter's six years old. It's incredible. <laughs> It's incredible. It feels like she was born yesterday. It's it's the time goes by so fast. It's scary. It yeah, really is scary. It really yeah. is scary. But everybody, if you're just finding out about Maria today, you can find her at AveberryExperience.co.uk. Is that the right? All right. So you guys could check that out. She also has a new book that just came out. I don't know if it's available in the States yet, but I'm pretty sure Maria can give you guys the information on that better while we talk. And uh, we're going to go pretty deep, I think, today on certain things, and you guys are going to be really pleased on some of the information that Maria has, because she goes pretty deep on Stonehenge, some of the stone circles that are all over the planet, and all a lot of megalithic sites that are everywhere as well. So let's talk about it. Let's go deep. Actually, you know what? Um, let's first talk about your dowsing, because I think the dowsing is what brought you into the finding some of the secret sites, right? behind Stonehenge and, and working with the energy line. So you got into yeah. dowsing as, as a young girl? That's right. I mean, my late father was a master dowser and published many books on Stonehenge as well. It's in the blood. And I kind of followed in his footsteps. So I've doused in 16 different countries worldwide, numerous ancient sites all across the world. And I look for the geodetic system of earth energies, which is part of my Dowson legacy that was given to my late father by uh, John Martineau, who got all of the Guy Underwood's work. Now, some of his work was incorrect because he was a pioneer. I also got given some uh, manuscripts by the master Dowser Tom Lethbridge, and some of it goes back to 1899 on water divining and how water creates chevron patterns, which is the universal word for water, whether it's in Egypt. So, yes, yeah, so I come with a big dowsing legacy, so to speak. So I kind of just catapulted myself into the ancient world. And through dowsing, I did find that the elongated skull of a woman in the Stonehenge environs. And that started me on a quest to find this ancient Neolithic civilization. I can't wow. hear you. So when we say dowsing, um, let's explain to some people what you mean by dowsing and some of the techniques that you use. That's uh, my dowsing rod. It's copper because copper is highly conductive and it's got a sleeve. And professional dowsers tend to use just one, but they come in a pan. So uh, with the dowsing rods, they can pick up on all different types of energy. But you've got to know what energy it is you're dowsing to be able to find it. Because if you just walked into an ancient site with a pair of dowsing rods or a dowsing rod, it would cross at underground water. It would cross at grids. It would cross at lays. It would cross at track lines and aquastats and genesis lines. I mean, the list is, goes on. There's 40 diff different, 49 different types of earth energy. So how do you, like, if for someone just starting out, how do you recommend them being able to tell the difference from dowsing maybe underground water pipes or something that could be under the ground? Because, right, because dowsing, you can, you can have underground pipes that it could oh, also, yeah. right? So yeah, it's 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 anything that's in the earth, whether that's man made or not. So you have to first of all, well, how I do it from my kind of druid ancestry is I always ask the landscape permission to douse. 
to the ancestors, the guardian and the spirit of place. And I stand with my feet slightly apart. And if I feel a gentle pull forward or to the side, that grants me permission. So that's the first thing I would do. Then I visualize that which I'm going to douse. So if I'm going to douse, for example, a primary halo, that's concentric circles of three or six circles of energy, that's what I tune into. And I tune into that. And then I ask the question with information dousing, is this ancient site associated with a primary halo energy pattern? Yes or no. If I get a yes, and that would be where the rod comes in like that or crosses, or for some people they repulse, then I would then say, show me the direction of the nearest primary halo and the rod would lead me to that energy pattern. Most stone circles are associated with that energy pattern because that's why stone circles have a circular shape because all the circles are on the central band of that concentric circle pattern. So it's really powerful because what happens then is that energy is absorbed into the stone and then it's transmitted in an aerial manner. So it starts off at Earth energy, the megalith changes it to aerial energy. And I proved that many, many moons ago with its Hertzian frequency and other things besides. So I know that happens. So it's really a place where there's energy conversion that's going on within a stone circle. It's so interesting. Now, do, do, do these patterns you're talking about, do they change like mandalas throughout the year no, or they no, stay the no. same? They, they are they stay the same and that's why certain energy patterns have certain shapes they're following that very permanent pattern so what causes that pattern for example with the primary halo it's water very very deep water known i call it yin water that's water produced within the womb of gaia independent of rainfall the earth produces water inside and then it generates that circular pattern and a spiral it can generate a spiral pattern as well or it's water under really sustained pressure and it will be completely replenished if it's uh, the water that's born with inside of the earth because it's always perpetual the rocks kind of produce the water on a very very deep level and it is really strong energy and when you come to a site such as Stonehenge that has six circular features or Woodhenge that has six circles that's because it's uh, sited upon a massive primary uh, halo pattern. That's interesting now with the stones is it possible because I know a lot of times that when water runs over certain stones and in the constrictions of the stones it's it's there's negative ions in the air and it strips the the ions from the water molecule molecules and it tends to put people in a, 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 a meditative state you know like when waterfall yeah. runs over yeah. water alpha brain and it, and it goes to the higher elevations so is most of these sites on higher level elevations too, there, some of them? There's, there's something different going on with the underground deep water that is a little bit different from surface water. What we notice in measuring the ion counts that you get, what happens is it reduces the positive ion. So you get an extra negative ion. So it's, it's to reducing the positive side of it which will give you and put your brain more into a relaxed mode and alpha state of like meditation uh, as well. So that's what it does. That's what we've measured. So we know that it's right down to gravitational forces as well. There's a lot of gravitational forces going on and many other things besides. But that's why we feel good in particular ancient sites. And some cathedrals that were sited previously on earlier sites that then became christianized yeah i know bluestone is great for that and you have that on on uh at stonehenge right yeah you have four different types of bluestone at stonehenge you have the spotted dolerite a very dark midnight color and then you have a beautiful just blue shade 
uh, which is a rhydolite form of bluestone. And then you have a green form of bluestone. We can't wow. see that today because they're buried under the ground. But you had all of these different colors. And incidentally, for example, think about Stonehenge. We see it as gray and weathered, don't we? That's how we see it. But when it was in pristine condition, the stone had a slightly pinkish silver tint to it has now been discovered. So we're seeing pink stones with uh, blue stones and green stones on the inside. And then the altar stones, because I think there was two and there's evidence for that. And I know who stole one. The two altar stones were green colored, flexed with garnet and mica. Stonehenge was a, a colorful place. But today we see it after four and a half thousand years of British rain and weathering <laughs> and the weather system here doesn't help to preserve the colors of stone wow so so there was one that was stolen even recently you're saying i i'm so i challenge the model of stonehenge to what english heritage say for example i think the original stonehenge yes it did have 30 lintled stones Crate and a, lind a perfect circle, on the inside of which originally there was two concentric circles of blue stones, inside of which there were trilithon settings and two altar stones inside of that. I contacted Professor Mike Parker Pearson from UCL University London and said to him, this is English heritage model. This is uh, my model. You, what do, Where do you stand in between these? And he said, I think like you and Richard Atkinson that there was two concentric circles, but English, English heritage doesn't put that out. Now, if you imagine that in 1624, you have, you're at Stonehenge, let's go to Stonehenge, you're there, it's 1624, and the King James I of England, James VI of Scotland, arrives at Stonehenge with his architect called Inigo Jones. Inigo Jones surveyed the site. He said that there was two altar stones. He describes them. They're both the same height. They're both uh, the same uh, color. Maybe one was slightly darker. So I looked in archaeological reports for any shards, that's chips of stones, stone chippings, that were one light colored altar stone and one dark. And bingo, I found that report by a geologist. So where is that stone? Well, Indigo Jones tells you what happens, as does James I. You see, when James I was, was there with uh, his, he was married to Queen Anne of Denmark. We had a boyfriend, the dashingly handsome Duke of Buckingham. And the Duke of Buckingham was with James I there. And there was a lean in stone. It was the Greater Trilithon. It was leaning like this. It got um, put up straight in 1901 by Colonel Hawley, but uh, the, the Duke, George Villiers, he said, I want to buy that stone from the landowner and take it back to London. The landowner refused and said, yeah, not, no stones for sale here. So he took the second altar stone and Inigo Jones even tells you where it went. He says, we carted it away in a cart, like a horse and cart. We carted it away to St. James's Palace in London. OK, so they even tell you where it is. Now, St. James's Palace to an American audience probably thinks, well, we think of Buckingham Palace. We don't think of St. James's Palace. But St. James's Palace preceded Buckingham Palace. It was the main royal residence. Now, up until 1930, archaeologists were looking for this second altar stone and they wrote letters to St. James's Palace saying, where is it and can we have it back? Well, the royal door was closed on them and they said no stone here exists but i think that it is true that it did end up at that particular palace but also you see james the first wrote the in english from latin saint james's bible St. James's version of the bible is the best selling book in the world for those that learn like google facts <laughs> and at the same time he wrote a book called demonology which was yeah. explaining all about uh, demons uh, and, and the like. And he started the witch hunt frenzy that all goes down to James I. In the meantime, his boyfriend, George Villiers, 
the Duke of Buckingham, is an occultist, as his mother is, and they're doing blood rituals with uh, with the King of England. So it is little surprise that the stone ended up there. They knew it had power, and they knew it had significance. There's a bit of a kind of red heron on the internet. Interesting. Which yeah, well, there's a bit of a red herring on the internet that tells us that uh, someone from Wessex Archaeology found the second altar stone in Berwick, uh, <clears throat> St. James. But they, they're not uh, the altar stone from sandstone, they're limestone. And yes, he did work for Wessex Archaeology, but he was the washer-upper. And so the the papers didn't kind of research him. So that's incorrect. That's on How big of a stone internet. are we talking about, Maria? Uh, when it's out of the ground, so to speak, and you're you're carting it away, as they described, it would be about sixteen feet. The other wow. big sarsins are about thirty feet tall. The, the the really large ones, you know, the well about twenty five feet. The big uh, trilophon, uh, but in the ground, I'm talking. You know, if you extend it, it would wow. be about can... that. So there's a there are tons, many yes. tons. Yeah, the, the the greater trilithon, which consists of two stones with a stone on top, that weighs near enough 95 tons. Is What's the oldest recorded drawings or sketches that, that you guys have of, of Stonehenge? Yes, the earliest recording of Stonehenge was a written account, and it was from the 12th century by Geoffrey of Monmouth. And it hints at what's why Stonehenge was built, because Geoffrey of Monmouth, was he wrote the book, The History of the Kings of Britain. It's still in print today. And he spoke of Merlin, King Arthur, uh, Bellinus, all of these different kings. And he also said about Stonehenge that no stone at Stonehenge doth not have healing power. He's telling you that if you put water by one of the stones and you do a few scrapings, that will heal you. And Professor Tim DeVille and the late Jeffrey Wainwright, they too say it's a healing temple. Now, I go one step further because in my legacy archive that was, you know, I inherited, there was a report from the custodian of Stonehenge for more than 25 years, he was very, very widely respected. And this custodian said that there was a very unusual stone at Stonehenge. For any geek out there, it's stone number 51 at Stonehenge. And if you go around the outside of the stone, it has a hole or it did have a hole that goes two feet right into the center of that stone. And what the custodian told us was that even in a drought, every day, that stone hole miraculously filled up with water. And so people used to go to that place for curing of eczema and, and various ailments besides. And it became quite famous. So what did the then Ministry of Works do, for instance? They concreted it up with concrete and plastic. So today it's plugged up, but you can see where the water runoff occurred. That's just one of the magical properties of Stonehenge that was defaced by the Ministry of Works on decree of the government. That's incredible. That's incredible. I can listen to you all day talk about this. Really, really could. So do you have um, some slides that you wanted to share? Uh, yeah, I can I can share some slides. Let me if you if you made me host. Yeah, you can uh, you can share screen if you go to the bottom and share whenever it you says want. Host disabled. Uh, let me say, let me, maybe I have screen. to do it again. Let me let me make sure. Now you're good. OK, so let's uh, go to here. and. Sure. I was going to put it. So in the crazy. people in the chat room, um, they're talking about they've never been to Stonehenge, but you offer actual tours at sites yes. throughout the year. So yes, you can. Can you let people my, know? Yeah, absolutely. You can go to my website, the Avery Experience .co .uk or Esoteric College .com. That's my teaching platform. And if you can't remember those, just go to MariaWheatley.uk and it'll take you to all of my websites. Okay. Awesome. 
But what we're seeing here is the elongated skull that I first discovered uh, from Stonehenge, very, very long. And then this is a reproduction of a skull that came from North Yorkshire, which wow. was longer than the Neolithic Queen. So th these are, like I say, I measured this skull and I measured the femur bone of that skull and she was about four foot nine. They were very short, the Neolithic. The Bronze Age appeared like giants compared to them. They came much later. Here's Queen Nefertiti, or it's believed to be Queen Nefertiti. She has also a very long, obviously mummified skull. And you have two types of long-skulled people in the ancient world. Some have uh, cranial deformation to fully extend their skulls, and some are naturally long, but they're a little bit shorter. So it's like the ruling elite in Egypt and in England had the elite with the long skulls and the kind of uh, mere commoners, so to speak, with these shorter skulls, but that is still a long skull. When you put uh, boards on the skull, it leaves two scars down here. And that's what happened on the long skulled, the very extended, what I call hyper elongated skulls. And this I call a lesser elongated skull. But one of the really unusual long skulled people they found, again, a woman, it was described by an antiquarian that visited a long barrow in Somerset and said that she had a really flat, very extended forehead and the eyes almost appearing on top of the head like this with a very long skull. So she was very, very unusual and she was placed really deep into a long barrow monument. So what's a long barrow monument? If you imagine a, a long ridge of earth that's man-made with an entrance with sometimes megalithic chambers, a bit like caves that you can go into. That's how a mound appears. And she was placed within one. And is, again, that, is it similar? Is a long barrel similar to a tumulus? Uh, a, a tumulus tends to be a round barrow and the long barrows precede them by sometimes a thousand years. They're wow. much, much older and they're long. And you found long skulls in long barrows and round skulls in round barrows. But again, what we're finding or what I found and was this, you've got long skulled people around lesser skulled people. That's a continuation that happens throughout ancient Britain. You can go to Scotland. But in, in Scotland, for example, their long skulls are mainly women. Then the, the lesser were men. So I think the in all places like Orkney, Kalanish, and around those areas, the, the women had the longest skulls. Now, were there ever any whole skeletons found with the skulls? Do we know this? Do we know this? The height, the estimated yes, height? Yes, absolutely. They they all came with the femur bones. Some were the unusual thing about Stonehenge is they were single burials or just a few burials. Whereas in places like Avery and Scotland and elsewhere, you had a lot of people going, like 36 mass, yeah, people. Mass. Yeah. But the femur bones were always there. And I measured a lot of femur bones as well, like I measured the skull. And they estimate the height. Once you've got a femur bone, you can tell the height of somebody. And the males were about five feet. The women were four feet nine same height as Nefertiti. She was about four. She was quite short as well. So these aren't giants. They came later in the English story uh, with the Bronze Age and their femur bones are exceptionally large, but they're 500 to 1,000 years later. They're not contemporary. Do you see what I mean? The, these people came first and the, the larger people came later. We know that because of the burial practices that they, they did. But I'm going to show you now Stonehenge phase one, because it's in different phases. So if we go back orthodox dating to 3100 BC, then there's 56 blue stones in a circle. But my custodian I mentioned earlier, who was at Stonehenge dig excavation with Professor uh, Richard Atkinson, said that Atkinson lied to the world about the henge and a henge is a ditch and a bank i'm going around with my cursor now that's the henge it's a ditch and a bank and richard atkinson said it was just chalk rubble piled up 
But the custodian, Tom Gorey, he said, no, it isn't. It's integral to the landscape and it's scooped out. It was all white at one time. And so it was like a pudding bowl. Do you see what I mean? Coming down and the ridge coming up like this. And he was uh, flabbergasted that he, the Richard Atkinson lied to the general public. He was there. He saw it. But here's what I think was going on. Whenever I go to the ancient sites, I find ochre. And ochre is like a hematite. You can get paint extracted powder from it. It comes in reds, golds, and browns. And look, all of their homes, this is a reconstruction of a, of a roundhouse, they're painted. So I think there is evidence, strong evidence, that a site that's similar to this phase one with a stone circle like this in Dorset had carvings of chevron patterns, circles and spirals, all of which are the shapes of earth energies. Now, I say perhaps it was like this, a chevron pattern. It could have been circles. This is demonstrating that I think Stonehenge Henge Bank was painted. And this represents how underground water goes through the earth. It can produce different patterns. And at Edfu Temple in... Uh, Egypt, you have the chevron pattern representing underground water is present at the site. And you know what's only... interesting, too? That's the way the plasma moves from the sun. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really interesting pattern that has meant a lot to people as above and so below. You know, so I think it was highly, highly painted. And this chalk base here, like I mentioned in the book, now could become highly reflective if that was maintained. And even if it was just for one event, when the moon is really high, uh, it would, because you've got these corners, it would create a caustic beam, which is like a very gentle beam of light. And it would come out to where my cursors is here. And it could have been somebody stood there. But it, well, you can get reflective properties from chalk, like water and snow. If you look at the moonlight on snow, it would behave exactly like an all-white henge. And I think it was painted at the entrances or in significant parts. And incidentally, the water table beneath Edfu is only 16 feet. And so they, they encoded that this that's the universal symbol for water. You could ask an Aboriginal person in Australia, what's the symbol of water? Chevron yeah. pattern. So yeah. it is uh, it is universal. Now, when we go to a place like Sardinia that uh, I've doused uh, many times, that too was painted on the inside. This is from the uh, archaeological de department of Sardinia. But look at it today. So if we go back, and it was the age of Taurus, and so we've got this lovely ball depiction here, depicting the age of uh, the astrological age of Taurus. That's what that would have looked like. And I suggest it was also on the outside. These were colorful places, and we see their homes. And also, what Colonel Hawley in 1901 discovered about Stonehenge is that, in part, one particular building there had a yellow plaster floor. So we know that they were using color uh, there. And this is my model of Stonehenge phase two. The other one was uh, Stonehenge phase one. What happened is uh, this lasted for about 500 years and it was aligned to a particular constellation. But we're looking at it in stage one. So that was it in stage one. Then it got dismantled. Yeah, they uprooted all the 56 blue stones and created what English heritage say is a lintelled circle of 30 standing stones, a circle here, which Professor Mike Parker Pearson and I disagree with, a horseshoe shape here, which we disagree with, and then this horseshoe shape here. Well, this is how I see it, and I've put in the colors now of the stones. Yes, they were a pinky color. This is the concentric stone circle here of two blue stone circles with an entrance of four blue stones here, creating a dramatic entrance as you're going through. And I've got the two altar stones here. But look, there's an extra trilithon that I've put in here. It's not over here. 
In the 1930s, a stone setting was found by English heritage, and it, and it was probably a trilithon. I've got a great source that said to me, it is a trilithon, and they buried it. I could even show you in my book where they buried it because it didn't fit the 17th and 18th century model model of Stonehenge. So I say, let's raise this trilithon. Let's put it back to, to how it was. But what evidence do I have for this dramatic entrance into Stonehenge? And these are highly magnetic stones. Nothing here. This is the excavation that's hidden. So that, from that would be the like the Holy of Holies kind of entrance, you think? Oh, absolutely, because they're all shaped in masculine and feminine shapes. But this is the actual uh, uh, excavation dig by Richard Atkinson. He's, he's, whoops, sorry, I'll just go back. He dug them out and there's one, two, three, four here, three here and two here, exactly as in the preceding model. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. And that's the excavation report. That's how it was. English heritage in one of their models kind of ruffle the stones up here and make them a little bit dotty as if that is the, the actual one. But we know that that is true. And again, why is English heritage saying models that don't exist? That's and that's question. like I say, so I've I've got the the reports from Parker Pearson. I've got the email agreeing with me as well. So when Inigo Jones in 1624, as I mentioned previously, went to Stonehenge using sacred geometry, he claimed that there was six trilithons. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. And so using that uh, model, let me just go back. I've put in that one there of Indigo Jones there. So that's what he says that sacred geometry creates, which is quite a marvel because at that time he was a very good architect. He made beautiful stately homes throughout the British Isles, actually. So I think Stonehenge is closer to what that model looks like. And the stones now with laser technology were thought to have been literally column shaped like this and precise because in the 19th century, hammers were sold from Amesbury town near to Stonehenge and people came along and started chipping off bits wow. and pieces because they thought it was healing. Again, we're going back to everybody thought it was healing up until that was written out of the Stonehenge guidebooks as it is today. That's incredible. So where is the missing trilithon? It's buried here. That's where I was shown. And there's on the original photograph, which is in my book, it's you can see the white stone top of it just before it went under the turf. So I think there's a lot of evidence to make a different version of Stonehenge than what we are used to seeing because we are spoon fed. And because it's so iconic, we forget that we don't know it. Do you know what I mean? We, we've been shown that image for so long, but here is a beautiful moon alignment at Stonehenge. Can you see the greater trilithon here is a bit yeah. bigger than all the other stones. That was deliberate. Everything in the ancient world had meaning. Nothing was by chance. And when the moon every 18.61 years is at its southerly minor position in the sky, just imagine it's a special event. And just like in this picture here, it would capture its upper limb in that window there. So if you were stood a little bit by what's called the heel stone and you were looking towards Stonehenge, you would see the moon embraced in that window. And so it's a lunar window into uh, Stonehenge. Is, and is there just, two heel stones at Stonehenge or one's missing? One's, they, I think there originally there was two heel stones, uh, two altar stones, sorry, and one was stolen by King James, who I'll show you an image of him in a moment. That but you, was, was there uh, two heel stones though as well or no? Uh, well, there's two controversial uh, ideas about that. Mike Pitts, who originally did the excavation of what's called Stone Hole 97, 
the heel stone is 96, thought it could be one of two things. It could have housed another heel stone or the heel stone was originally there, then it got moved. So there's two different ideas about that and nobody really knows for sure. But you get one author talking about one idea, another author talking about another idea. There's probably two, uh, really, because everything was paired uh, uh, at Stonehenge. But this is the leaning stone I mentioned earlier that the Duke of wow. Buckingham wanted to buy. It's being put up right now. This is from the 19th century drawing of Stonehenge. It's badly leaning right on top of a blue stone there that was about to be crushed. So Colonel Hawley put it straight. That's the stone the royal family originally wanted. And this is the, uh, uh, at the top, we've got King James I. At the bottom, we've got the dashingly handsome Duke of Buckingham, as he's often been referred to. And as I said, James I produced the Holy Bible, the King James Version. And he also wrote Demonology as well, because he was uh, a known occultist. And like I said, it got carted away to St. James's Palace. They even told you uh, where it went. Now, just to finish off my slide presentation so we can get back to having a talk, I'm going to show you the secrets of the mounds that uh, I discovered, along with uh, an engineer friend of mine. This is Here, incredible, by the way. Thank you for doing this for us. This is a real treat. Uh, you're people, people are loving it in the chat room. Everybody's loving it. Uh, well, we're telling the truth. We we are truth seekers, you and I, and we're telling the truth. And I'm saying this is probably what Stonehenge looked like, okay? Now we're going to go to the secrets of the mounds. Why did ancient man create this beautiful mound here, the largest in northwest Europe, very close to the world's largest stone circle called Avebury Henge? That's in England. This is yours in America. It doesn't look much different, does it? That's Grave Creek Mound in West Virginia, okay? They're identical, near enough. I mean, that, that's why I've put them together. So America has very similar mounds to the world's largest stone circle called Avebury Henge, and we can chat about that later if you wish. What makes this mound? Is it slabs of granite? Uh, no, that's a really good question. The, the mound in, it's called Silbury Hill, is made up, and this is really interesting, my late father noticed uh, this, on the inside of the mound, it's in layers of organic and inorganic material, which is a bit like an organ accumulator. Wow. Of Wilhelm Wright. Almost like throwing Bain. metal shavings and different things in there, right? Yeah, but kind of yeah, more kind of natural substances, uh, so to speak. But it's then it was then cased with massive chalk block, making it brilliant, white like how the pyramids of ancient egypt were finished off with limestone yeah wow. so that's so we're seeing it today grassed over like we see the stones at stonehenge or gray but we know that there was color there and when we have that white effect so let's say this is white like it was all archaeologists know that and i've got the great pyramid to one side that you can see here and it's capped with the gold. That's how everybody said it was finished off. And we took measurements on the summit of Silbury Hill with its measure and its electrostatic field. And we experienced an energy surge there of 220,000 DC volts that kind of blew the equipment, <laughs> put it all back together. <laughs> uh, and it, we, we are saying if a copper rod or gold just like the pyramid, because it did reflect the, the pyramid. Like a Ben Ben placed, stone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Placed on top of the pyramid there, then what would happen when the electrical start charge build it up through the day and at night it would start to get give a blue haze all wow. around it. Okay. Now, has that been seen at Silbury Hill? Yes, it has. It's been photographed by some somebody. They won't let me use their photograph. Uh, at all, so I'm not going to go into a copyright uh, law there. But he captured at the full moon when it would be at its strongest a haze, blue haze being emitted by Silbury Hill. So that's one of the secrets. I think they were lighting up the dark, 
And could you wow. imagine seeing blue against uh, white? And for people that want to, you know, know where to get the book, I thought I'd write it so people could see that, theaveryexperience.co.uk, so cool. esotericcollege.com, and keeping it simple, mariawheatley.uk, because I'm a Brit. <laughs> so that, cool. So there's some of the ways that we can relook at ancient science in Britain. And I think similar things were probably going on in ancient America as well. I don't think it was just reserved for England, for example. Yeah, me either. I, it's all it's all over for sure, all over the world. And, and you know, people don't realize it because we only have a couple of hundred years history here in mm. in America. But like we have some of the oldest like right here in New York. In the Hudson Valley, we have mm. the oldest forest on Earth. They just found a 380 million year old forest. And ironically, Cairo, they say they they call it, they pronounce it in the town Cairo, but it's it's spelled Cairo, New York. And there's mm. the oldest forest on Earth that was just found. So we have millions and millions of years of petrified forests, even in New York. So. Uh, absolutely. And I'll be dousing Charco Canyon for any American listener that would like to meet me and learn dousing. I'll be at Charco Canyon on the 25th and 26th of August and details are on my website. And we'll be looking at the unique palaces uh, and temples of Charco with the great houses. And I'll also be going to Aztec ruins because I really do like delving into ancient sites worldwide. So I'm certainly not going to exclude America. Yeah, no doubt. I, I, I'm I looking forward to you one day coming so we can go to the Balanced Rock together. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. So in Chaco Canyon, um, is there certain spots of that area that has a negative vortex of energy sort of or negative currents of energy? Because I've heard that just from me reading about certain locations in the past, certain books I've read, I've heard that a lot of sacrifice that's, and that's that's one one aspect but if you go back to the original charco why did they put it there they, they had no trees to build it they had to import 20 uh 250,000 trees to build charco it once had four stories containing 650 rooms okay it was massive and it had no uh resources no farming resources according to most professors of, of colorado that are the the archaeologists of charco so it's an arid landscape it would be crazy why why build it there because it wasn't just a vortex there you never just get one thing in earth energy sure. they all charco canyon or pueblo bonito meaning a beautiful town i think from uh spanish it's a d-shape and that became a template for all the other great houses, of which there were 12 surrounding uh, Pueblo Bonito. Why a D-shape? Again, why a stone circle? That's um, a shape that the Earth manifests, called a secondary halo, and that's the template they use. Not all of those great houses are on that. It's the template. Do you sort of mean uh, Pueblo Bonito is? And so all the rest are. And also it has the Great North Road going up through it yeah and that great yeah. north road uh, which actually uh professor steve lexon said is the meridian line well i'm taking it one third step further and say i agree with you uh steve lexon it is a meridian line for sure because it goes north to south but it's a ley line that goes through it now in england the most powerful lays are a lay system so what's a lay system imagine that you've got a straight line like that and you've got a female current of energy meandering around it and a male current a bit like the caduceus symbol or a strand of dna that's a lay system so i thought well it's got such a powerful great north road that's its technical name it should be great north ley line <laughs> but we're not going to change american archaeology that way so right going through that, you have two currents entwining it. And of course, in England, the energies were called, that entwined the St. Michael ley line, they were called Mary and Michael, because every 10 kilometers or eight miles, a church would be dedicated to St. Michael on the St. Michael Earth current that meanders and Mary on that. But what I noticed uh, about the kind of 
the whole ambiance of charcoal, I just uh, kind of intuitively, intu intuitively felt to call them wolf and deer because it's like yin and yang opposites, you know, like male and female. And then I just researched one day, what does charcoal actually mean? Hunting ground. So that was very fit for deer and wolf. And they, they target particular architectural features of these great houses, which are they're now looking the professors and calling them temples. They, they're changing their minds on the old 1950s and 60s interpretation. And so we have these male and female earth currents imbuing some with feminine energy. So yes, you have vortex, then you've got a lane, then you've got male and female uh, currents, then you have primary halos. A, a, a sacred site has numerous energies, not just one or two. Yeah. That's what I mean. It the has the to red, the red rock area over there. I'm, I've never been there. I've been to Sedona, uh, mm. but I, I, I lived out in, in Arizona for like three months at, at one time. But I never actually went to Chaco Canyon. But I, I've heard certain areas of the red rocks is is really intense energy. That's why I was wondering, you know, what oh, you've experienced absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. But the great thing is, you know, with some of the more modern archaeologists, they're indigenous archaeologists now. OK, so you, you don't just have, you know, the old school, so to speak. And one thing they notice about where you get the huge, um, I think you call them mesas. Uh, um, Mesa, to me, they, yeah. Mesa, I kept calling them Mesa because it's M-E-S, but I got told off lots of times they're Mesas. So you've got these huge Mesas, haven't you, that just appear in New Mexico and Colorado are like around four corners. Well, the ancient Americans always said that they were water sources and they are perched aquifers inside of those huge Mesas are, is water. And water will seep out and it will make a white color against the black. And that's where you get a lot of petroglyphs. They realize this water was sacred. You could grow things there. So you have these, there's nowhere else around that area where you have perched aquifers. Aquifers are normally deep in the ground. Okay. Yeah. So, so that area emits then through that circular earth energy pattern. Imagine around that uh, mesa, you've got concentric circles of energy rippling out because that's an aquifer energy pattern, but it's now perched. And so it's going around it, not just in the ground. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So it makes a whole area very, very powerful for those that know how to use that energy. And I'm sure the indigenous peoples did. Yeah, it's incredible. I really think a lot of these stone circles and stone sites, it's like what you're talking about completely the waters and it's like connecting those patterns of waters to the, the cosmic waters, the solar waters, you know, the, yeah. the waters that's coming from the sun, the plasma waters. It's the same. It's the same. And those those stone circles actually look like a solar wheel of the seasons and time. Right. Mm -hmm. A specific alignment or pattern for a specific, you know, it's an incredible like even Giordano Bruno had like specific like like solar wheels and times in his writing. And they look specific like certain grids like that as well. It's mm -hmm. it's really incredible. And mm -hmm. and there's certain times of the year where the doorway of light comes right through the certain holy of holies area, just like in Newgrange and different spots all over all over all over right so that it's like almost a doorway of information whether it's for souls yeah. to travel on or it's for information to come through or for some sort of knowledge to be obtained uh, absolutely i think everything is multifaceted it's not yeah. just one thing you know there, there's layers of information coming through and as above and so below the ancients always cited that and i think you know there's no coincidence that for, for instance, you have New Grange light box uh, aligned to the winter solstice. But author James Swagger went one stage further as well, which is quite interesting about that light box at New Grange, is that also it has the triple spiral on the outside of a stone, doesn't it? It's very famous New Grange for its triple spiral. And listeners can Google that. It's beautiful uh, megalithic artwork. There's also a smaller version of that on the inside of New Grange. And what James Swagger suggests is that the winter solstice is just a countdown for when Sirius 
lines up in the box and then it aligns to the spiral at the back of the chamber as well so i think again it's not just one thing it's not just the sun it's serious and it can lead to other speculations as well some people say venus as well that can align to it and here we see now this beautiful triple spiral but that's on the inside at right at the back of that megalithic site. So there's two lots of spirals there. This is Newgrange, right? That's Newgrange, yeah. triple spiral. I'm trying to go there next year. I'm hoping I could take my family there next year. Mm. It's it's a wonderful site. My my top tip to you, if you're going to that part of Ireland, County Meath, is get private access uh, for your family to Four Knox, like the letter four, F-O-U-R, Four Knox, Knox just means hill in uh, in Irish. And you can have private access. You, you you give a little deposit. I think it's like 20 or 30 pounds. You get that back. And then you can have access to a wonderful megalithic site with intense uh, megalithic artwork. It's absolutely beautiful. You see, here's uh, one of the solar wheels of, of uh, the time and the seasons. This is for right from Giordano Bruno's writings. And he says, even from look from clockwise from top, it's midday from noon and all the different, you know, how it goes. And it looks almost like the patterns of stone and a stone circle. Yes. And there was an artifact discovered through Dowson by Guy Underwood that is called the solar disc. And it's a circle with that very famous kind of cross uh, in the middle of it that's very similar to that. And you can overlay the eightfold year, the lunar cycle, the hours of the day into that same system as well. Now, this this site is in uh, Golan Heights, Gilgal Raphaim, which is uh, like Israel near Lebanon. And there's like actually hundreds of megalithic dolmens and and stone circles and everything in this area the military also controls this area and there's war in this area all over the place as well this is the site where uh king king og of bashan was said to be buried mm -hmm. um uh, it is yeah. it's very reflective as well you've got another site in ancient america that is very similar to this uh, I can't, can't think what it's called at the moment but in it's ohio different. right the the circle um uh no, no, it's not in Ohio. Not in Ohio. Uh, it's, oh, it's, no, it's a bit further south than that, but uh, I can't remember its name. But it's, I know which one you're talking about as well, though. Yeah. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about as well. So let's talk about, before before we wrap it up, let's, let's talk about a little bit about um, Kalanish. Actually, you guys could see in the background Kalanish before, because you this is a site that you've been to before. Right. Absolutely, several times. Actually, I've been to Kalanish several times, and I had the good fortune in 2006 to meet the main researcher there called Margaret Curtis, who has sadly passed away since oh. that time. So that's, that's very sad. But what she didn't know about Kalanish, and I kind of, you know, hung out with her for a little while, uh, so to speak. And I will be doing a tour there in 2025 because. A lot of tour guides are selling this year as being the moon's metonic cycle, but the actual date next year is more point, more exact. It's coming up to the alignment now. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit like it's coming up. You've got to get it on the right day, uh, so to speak. Now, at Kalanish, what Margaret Curtis discovered was you've got a kind of circular area and you've got an avenue of stones, but you've got a hillock, a small hill, which we call a hillock, in front of it. And the moon's metonic cycle is majestic at Kalanish because in front of Kalanish, curiously or sculptured, it's massive. You have the outline of a goddess figure called the sleeping goddess. And so she's got her head and her breast and her legs. You know, it's, it's really quite, quite something. And the moon is so low, it is most southerly moonrise and moonset, it's low. It's not going to go high like it normally does, it's low. And it skims and touches the sleeping beauty, as she's called, that hill range. Amazing. Correcting the, the goddess. And then the drama begins. The moon, it's low, it's honey-coloured because of the atmospherics. It swings round towards its setting in in Kalanish. And if a woman of average build 
put our arms outstretched like this. You can only see part of that of me on Skype. And obviously what would happen is this. The woman would be a silhouette touching the outside of the moon. She would be inside of the moon. And that's what Margaret discovered. And then if she kind of moved like this in a particular manner, then her shadow is cast upon all of the participants that are watching from the avenue. And then it sinks and it goes jet black. And the event is over. And I was there in 2006 to watch the moon's metonic cycle. I watched it go all around the sleeping goddess. And then as it came to its finale, there was a big cloud in the way. So unfortunately, I didn't get to see that. But I got to douse all of the earth energies. I got to study with Margaret Curtis. And I, what I loved about that is um, the moon often in many cultures represents femininity and the goddess and the triple goddess. And it was Margaret, who was a woman, that discovered that particular alignment. And I discovered at Avebury Henge that one of the stones there that's carved and it's made flat, a bit like the Stonehenge stones, that too aligns to the moon's platonic cycle, but at its most northerly. So the moon can be really high in the sky at its most northerly, or it's going to be at its most southerly low down. And it was a magical moment when I watched that moon rise from Avebury. And I earlier I'd seen it in Calanese. So I've been doing this for, uh, you know, over 18 years. I'm not new to this cycle of the moon. I know where the energies are strong because I've studied it in uh, different locations. So I have the experience to put people in the right place at the right time within these sites because the energies there can transform you. It's a window of opportunity only every 18.61 years that can raise your consciousness, that can create a doorway to who you want to become. It is alchemic. That's amazing. That's really incredible. Yeah, there's the stones at Kalanish. That's one of the, my goals for next year is the new Grange in Kalanish because that's that's the spot that's been calling me. And I've actually, I think I've made a pretty big discovery with the interpretation of some of the mythologies and what the site's connected to. I actually think it's connected to, you know, the information coming from the sun and the orchestra of music that the sun makes as the information passes through the magnetosphere because of the the mythology with with they say on midsummer night how the the shining one walks up the avenue of stones heralded by the cuckoo's call all right so that's really incredible maria because um what we have around the the earth is our magnetosphere right and as yeah. the sun sends these electrons in these magnetic field lines when some of the electrons get caught in our magnetosphere which is information electrons is just information coming into into earth Right. And and, and Kalanish is a spot where you see auroras throughout the year. So it's a mm. spot where there's a hole in the magnetic field. So the electron is going to come right through. So when the electrons come into the magnetic field, it makes a sound right before dawn, like birds chirping, like the cuckoo bird or the hoopoe bird or the woodpecker, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's the cuckoo's call. The shining one is the sun walking up the avenue of stones, heralded by the sound of the inf of the information of the sun that's coming through the magnetic shield it's and i think that stone circle is literally connected to not just the stone wheel of the sun but the the magnetosphere and the information that's coming through the sun at certain times of the year it's a doorway of light right to mm -hmm. the stones and and your those stones are ancient granite right so that the stone circle is going to squeeze and compress the granite to open up that piezoelectric light that's coming from it so it's like a doorway of light from there to the sun yeah, I mean, it is very highly charged at Kalanish. And it was, it's quite, it's quite intact because originally it was so covered in peat that it originally looked like a dwarf stone circle. They were only poking up wow. out of the ground. They had to mow it down, peat. huh? Yeah. So they, they kind of went down and dug the Kalanish out. But that was its savior because otherwise the stones would have probably been taken away and used for builder material, which was the fate at Avery Henge, for example, a lot went for building material. What, what's it called, Maria? Nice granite or something like that? The the yeah, stone. Lucian. Yeah, it's it's from the like the Isle of Lewis. 
Plateau. It's kind of like got Lewis uh, and that's the it's unique to, to that area. But the, here's the thing that I love about Kalanich is, you know, you've always got archaeologists talking about the roller method. They put the stones on wooden rollers and then they could move the stones around. Yeah. It's not what I think. But anyway, but the great thing about Kalanich, no trees. So that you've, you've, you know, you haven't got any trees there because it's a windswept environment where trees just can't grow in certain parts of Scotland because it's too windy. So, so they did not move the stones at Callanish that way. But the thing is, well, about Callanish, uh, I my top tip to you again, I'm giving you some top tips, take two cameras because one will blow or take two phones because I've always found that at Kalanish it will it will just blow one of suck my the, uh, suck cameras. the battery wow yeah. that's well, incredible no, one one of my cameras I mean it's a really good camera it was, it was an icon you know it was quite expensive actually and I was just photographing one of the stones has got a carving of Pern the hunter the antler uh, god it's got carving on one of the stones. It's absolutely beautiful. And Margaret Curtis was describing this. So I thought I'd get a picture of Margaret, you know, describing Herm the Hunter. And my camera just went white flash. I saw this massive white flash come out of the camera and then bump, dud. Damn. Now, can you, when you have to take obviously a ferry there, right? Yes, you do. So can you like see it like a, the as you're coming up in the ferry? Is it like, or no? no? No, no, you'll you'll go to the port. But when I arrived for a summer solstice, I've done the moon and the sun at, at Kalanish. And I was arriving for the summer solstice with a private group. And it was one of the most mystical things I've ever seen. Wow. The whole island was surrounded by this otherworldly mist. Whoa. Yeah? So you could see the top of it and it was kind of swirling around. And I was transfixed and thought this is just how the Celts describe some of the otherworldly islands in some of their journeys, in their stories. And I felt like a Celt arriving at one of these mythical isles. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Now, let me let me ask you a question. Have you found in your research or do you feel um, intuitively, because I do with this, that a lot of these sites were connected to not just concentric circles, but people doing spiral dances around them and possibly specific mantras to the sun to anchor in that sound energy, the cosmic energy with the, with the energy on earth to sort of anchor in those energies. And, and yeah, yes. I mean, I think what was being done again was different things at different times of the year for different purposes. It's not just a one uh, fixed thing. And anyone that moves on the earth, uh, leaves behind what's called a remnant trail in Dows in terms, in professional Dows in terms. And you can track that. I mean, my father was a master at that. I'm okay at it. It's not my forte, but I'm okay at remnant uh, Dows. Like a fingerprint. So, yeah. So if, I, if I'm walking around a lot and I repeat a particular dance or I repeat a particular movement and I'm walking it, you leave that remnant trail behind for all time. Do you see what I mean? So you have that going on in the ground as as well. And I really do think, I mean, one of my discoveries, which I talk about in uh, in the book, is that these concepts like a metaphysical ha- tracker. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, it's great fun to to remnant styles as well. Get someone to walk around and then follow them five minutes later. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. Quite good. Awesome. And I noticed in the some of the spiral patterns, like at Newgrange and the ones in the ground and the uh, primary halos, that they equate to musical intervals. And that was one of my discoveries. So, for example, at Stonehenge, in between the Sarsen Stone Circle and the Blue Stone Circle that survives today, that uh, mathematical proportion is five over four that's called the major third but this is being now forget about the maths this is equating and coming up out of the ground the music of Gaia so as much as you've got something going on the cosmos that's coming out of the ground Christians in cathedrals and churches and abbeys they often use the major third in their singing why because it heightens your emotions whereas the the Masons always use E flat 
because that's the key of the devotion to God and for knowledge and wisdom. But if I was to use, for example, uh, D major flat, that's another key that you can sing in or, or, or you know, have music in. That's the music that is going to make you feel really upset and edgy. And it will make you feel your fears come out, for, for example. So prior to the 18th century, if I said to you, the, if I said, if I was Mozart, stood up and said, I'm going to do something in A flat, they go, oh, it's a grave song. That's the song of the grave. Whereas modern day music has all of them near enough the same, uh, so to speak, but in the times past. And that's what I realized coming out of the ground in these concentric circles were all of these musical harmonics. And the, then sometimes you have primary ones that repeat themselves, like at the Sphinx Temple and at Stonehenge. So I'd like to think that Pythagoras discovered the music of the spheres. The harmony of the spheres, yeah. The harmony of the spheres. And Kepler said, in legend has it, Pythagoras could hear the music of the spheres. Kepler said, on the other hand, uh, an astronomer of the Renaissance time, he said the soul can hear it. What I think with my music of the earth, that's just the same as theirs, but instead of being planetary circles, it's the circles of the earth that the soul can hear Gaia's music as we walk around yeah. that circle. And I'm that so can glad be you're saying very, this. Very healing. It can be yeah. absolutely immense. I'm so glad you're saying this because that was part of what I left out, even what I was mentioning before, because that music that's coming from the sun, the information that's coming from the sun, the sound that it makes in the magnetosphere around Earth is the same frequency that opens up plant cells, the stomata in the plant cells that makes plants grow. And birds mimic these sounds right before dawn to help the plant cells grow and be abundant. And it's like the information that's coming from the sun to help everything in nature be harmonically evolved together, you know. And the, the, the birds start doing that right before dawn, an hour before dawn. They start making that bird song that helps mm -hmm. the plants open up. And the, the sun is making the same orchestra. Yeah, and in, in terms of musical and mathematical ratios, the the frequency of the of the sun is the perfect fifth, three over two. And some birds sing in that on an octave. And yeah. so again, I, I think it's a kind of uh like I've mentioned a couple of times, as above and so below. And when we have this union between the two, and we're between these two, you know, we're not isolated, we are a part of this incredible uh, harmonic energy and then we work with this we can change and transform things uh, and it will give us power in both our words and our works and yeah. that's how i see it is the kind of meshing together and we are magicians every human being is a magician yeah we're, we're not just connected magic. to the the telluric lines we're connected to the like the the solar the stellar energies are connected to the spinal current of who we are like our spinal current you know like mm. exactly it's it's, it's, inc it's incredible yeah it's it's been a pleasure maria having you on today i i wish we could do this way more often this has been amazing <laughs> people are loving this so maybe we can have you on again in a few months i know you're really busy but um it's been a pleasure so everybody you can find maria wheatley at averburyexperience.co.uk and it's really amazing uh you guys have uh all sorts of tours you could take with maria as well so contact her or if you want to contact me and i'll give you her information that's fine as well um can they get your books yet in the united states uh, yes, we can go through my website, actually, because uh, Amazon wanted to put me on their program where they take 60 percent and I have to what? pay the postage. Yep. they 60 percent. Yep. So Damn. I'm selling from for my uh, website and that the, the price includes the postage, which is very expensive to the United States now. But the, it will be the same price as what Amazon wanted it for anyway. So I'm not doing anything different, but I want to be more independent as well. And a lot of people uh, in England want to be away from this monopoly yeah. called uh, Amazon. It's uh, worse than the mob. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree, right. Definitely they are the mob. 
That's lovely. I hadn't thought about that one, but yeah, I shall use that coin of phrase. Yeah, they don't give that kind of high percentage in the mob. <laughs> Maybe 20%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless. Thank you so much. It's been a, a true blessing having you on. Everybody, Maria Wheatley, thank you for spending time with us, Maria. And oh, 